honestly um, appreciative of your enemy and then wishing them all the best. Uh, even though it sounds counterintuitive, it just frees up so much of your mental bandwidth. It, it just like it is a power move in your own head. It's like you are not controlled by envy. You're not controlled by hatred. You're not controlled by this darker, you know, devices of your own existence. If you just wish them, by honestly, to be happy and, and to sort their own lives. Welcome to the Mindful Dream Podcast. All about how to chase your dreams without losing sight of what's really important. Today's guest is Tony Carraza, who's the founder of MadX Digital. He's had quite a crazy career. He started off working in embassies, then he taught English for Natural Geographic in China. But he had to end that early when COVID struck. When he returned to Europe, he wasn't sure what to do with his life. He started writing and found he loved that, and then merged this with his passion for business to create his marketing agency. Since this recording, Tony's become a good friend of mine, and I hope you enjoy listening. Welcome to Mindful and Driven, Tony. It's a pleasure to have you here. You actually live about 10 minutes away from me, but today you're joining us from somewhere else across the world. Where are you? Hi, 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 Mardeep. I am in Mexico, in Playa del Carmen, which is the Caribbean side of Mexico. And it's so funny because I do live 10 minutes from you, but I barely ever see you. And now, <laughs> like, from Mexico, we're, like, all over each other. So, yeah. I don't know, putting that distance kind of works. <laughs> Makes the heart grow fonder. It does, yeah. Again, super happy to be here, uh, mindful and driven. I've seen that you come a long way in such a short time span. Like I was listening to some of the episodes last night and I was like just mind blown by the guests and everybody. I was like, ooh, getting some imposter syndrome right here. But it was like because everybody else was so good. And you know, like some some great stories. How do you feel about it? Do you ever get like just interviewing like, you know? A big personality and you're like oh why am i even talking to this person I, th- I think there's a mix some people what i've realized is no matter who you talk to they're all just people at the end of the day and a lot of the people who've got some of the most amazing stories they also have very relatable stories too and it doesn't matter how much if you're a billionaire or if you've saved a million people's lives you still struggle with the same problems we all have and even those people struggle with their balance they overwork or they put too much pressure on themselves sometimes. So I think that's been quite refreshing is that everybody's human at the end of the day. So it doesn't matter how big you are, how famous you are, how many followers you are, you have. We're all human and we all have the same human issues. I I guess, yeah, at the end of the day, we're all human and we can do human things. And yeah, it's nice to feel related or relatable with somebody that's up there, like one of your guests was saving women around the world. It's like running away from war zones. And, and that kind of struck a chord with me because, you know, I was born in a war zone uh, as a kid and um, I don't remember much of, much of it, but it did leave, you know, some, you know, some baggage with you, especially you're trying to go outside and it's like, no, bad man is shooting, just stay in. And as a kid, I was like, okay, cool, guns and army, I'm going to be in the military. I'm not going to be in the military. <laughs> but yeah, and, and then like listening to her podcast and then listening to Ash straight after, like it was it was refreshing. It was nice. I guess that's really interesting because if you've grown up in a war zone and now you live in like central London and it's a very different, obviously, atmosphere, you've probably seen different people give advice that don't fit both worlds, obviously. Have you ever seen that before where someone's giving you advice that you just think isn't quite working for you or wouldn't work for lots of people. 100%. I, I feel like it most advice is like, it is so like situation specific. It also like depends on where you are in your head space or where you are in your life. I don't know. I don't think any advice is like one size fits all. Like it's just not. And then something that doesn't work for somebody else can work, work wonders for you. And, and coming to England, especially after living in China as well, which is another intense period of my life it was just like all this um, extreme world like views just colliding and um, it was very humbling for me to just you know like uh, settle up in London so as I was growing older I was just getting more and more grateful for for life and being alive and and having nice and wonderful friends and so I I don't know why but like I'm getting less fussed about anything now just because like I feel like I've been blessed to actually come to London in the end and I didn't know I would actually enjoy enjoy this much because previously I would come as a tourist and 
there's so many tourist traps. It is one of the biggest tourist destinations on the planet. So like if you are green and young, they will rip you apart. And uh, now living in central London or uh, we're like east, uh, northeast a bit, uh, I, I'm loving it. Like I'm, I'm, I met so many wonderful people, business partners, started two businesses in London. I love the climate. I love the people. And, and I mean climate in, in terms of weather. Weather is another story. But I love just like, you know, the, the, the mental climate and the people you can meet. It's such a hot spot and like just this melting pot of, of uh, talent and, and intriguing stories. So it was nice to hear that you actually live around the corner, technically speaking. Yeah, and um, you know, I before even I moved to London, I was in Oxford, and I remember in one of your stories you did mention um, one of my work and uh, one of my articles. I was like, oh wow, this is interesting. And then I like, actually to meet you later on and to meet other people from Medium, uh, that was that was big. I don't know why. I just felt like I'm in the right place. It's one of those crazy things. I think. For me, a lot of my growth initially was during the pandemic. And a lot of people were reaching out online. There's lots of these conversations. There was calls, whatever. But now that, well, at times, restrictions have opened up. We've been able to just go out and see each other. It just makes such a difference because I think when you're able to talk to somebody face-to-face, you get a better sense of them. And I've had amazing conversations with people online and had the uh, for, like the luck to be able to talk to them and to learn their stories but in my case I always think there's something different about being able to see people in person and you just get that deeper sense of who they are rather than the zoom facade in a way and I think people relax a bit more in person you talked about China there briefly can you tell us a bit more about that because there's a story behind that you've told me in a pub before and I think it's quite a good one for the readers to learn. Um, it is a crazy one at that as well, because um, after uni, um, I, I got a job offer with a consulting agency in China, which I didn't know at the time, like consulting in China is a bit different than consulting in Europe and the Western world. So I got there and they, they kind of just act as a hiring agent. So they just like move you further along the line. And I, I was quite lucky in that regard because I landed a job in National Geographic. It was like a Chinese instance of it. And for a like nine months, I was okay. I was like, just sitting around the office, having like, just a normal office job, watercolor conversations, trying to learn the Chinese. And then the pandemic hit. And coming from the West, you have this sense of suspicion against media in general. So when they do report a story, you always, always feel it's sensationalized, it's overblown. The reality is probably not as bad. Uh, whereas in the East, especially in China, if uh, the media reports something, it's going to be underplayed. Um, so uh, when COVID hit, I had that um, feeling of like, no, this is not a big deal. And uh, I just went on a holiday because it was Chinese New Year. It was the end of Ju- uh, sorry, end of January, January 20th. So around this time, actually. And um, I went to Cambodia, had a nice trip, and like you would just hear like coronavirus, coronavirus, or some like nasty videos with Circle Online and WeChat and Chinese internet because it's a completely different place. And then as soon as I got into the plane, I was like, oh my God. And then we, we landed back in Xi'an where I lived. And as soon as we uh, stepped out of the plane, you were welcomed by a medical quarantine. Everybody in hazmat suits was a proper science fiction movie and that kind of it's hard to like relay this in a story or words in itself it was just like this visceral feeling of unsafety where you just like we got in a, into a cab in a taxi and then we were going home and then you had the street barricades on every barricade they would stop get you out of the car and then nobody speaks english and my chinese is awful so like nobody really understands why are you even there. So like a lot of times they just don't know what to do with you, and they're like, okay, just move along, move along. But like there's that twenty minutes if you like, you don't know if you're gonna disappear in the next 10, 10 minutes, and nobody will ever hear about you anymore. And then I got back to my flat, and then again, you know, the barricades and people in hazmats, uh, armed guards in front of your door, and they were like, okay, just stay put, don't leave the house. And I was like, how do I buy food? <laughs> They're like, okay, we'll let you leave four times in the next month, and that's all you get. And then you have to report every day that you're in the house, and then you have drones flying around if you do actually leave. And it's also guarded because a lot of people live in these gated communities. It's quite normal. And then, like, in front of 
the, the gates, they would just put hazmat suits with, with guns, which is like, guns are scary, hazmat suits are scary, combined, it's terrifying. And after like four weeks of just not knowing what's going on, you just hear some photos, you just see some photos of like, I don't know, some, I don't know, dead bodies piling up or, or something like that. And then, I don't know, I was just trying to get, get away because it was hard. And I made my way after a month. So it was early March. I made my way to Oxford. And then I came here and it was like three weeks before a disaster. Nobody was like paying attention. People were having coronavirus parties. My girlfriend at the time, like my girlfriend right now, so not at the time, so. <laughs> she, uh, she was going to a party that night. I was like, mm, I'm not quite on board with everything that China did there because that was a bit overreaching. But I, I don't think you should go to a party. I don't know. I just, it felt like I just stepped into this different world. And I was again, like an alien in New York, as Tim would say, like I was again, this, this weird guy I was like telling everybody, please don't go like on mass gatherings outside. And like three weeks later, everything shut down. We went to Berlin for, for a weekend. Uh, they ran out of toilet paper. And, and then we, we came back and we decided to, she has a house in Croatia in, in like near the capital. So it was quite in the mountains. It was super nice. Uh, so we went there and that's where I started my publication. So writing daily, I couldn't leave the house. I stopped drinking alcohol altogether, completely dropped, which when I came back to England uh, was, that's a different story though. But yeah, um, so I think in, in hindsight, uh, it was scary, but it's also like, I, I kind of came forward with myself. I quit my job in China. I started writing every day. I was afraid for my life. So I was just like typing away at that keyboard and like, you know, fingers to the bone, just like blasting away article after article. After. I, I just, I loved it. But I also felt that I, I have to make a living out of this. I can't live on my savings forever, especially now there is so much uncertainty. And, and I'm in hindsight, I'm so happy I, I did it because if I was in a nine to five, I don't think that would work for me. I think this lifestyle just makes me happy or happier. It is challenging. It is intriguing. Look back at that. So the amount of change you've been for the last few years is quite crazy, right? Because you were working in National Geographic in China. Then you've moved around a little bit and now you're in London and you've got your own business and you're running that and you're growing that and I know it's doing pretty well. So how did that feel for you? Like you said, imposter syndrome for coming onto the podcast, but going from what you were doing to now what you're doing now, how did you gain the confidence to make some of those shifts? Because going from writing to then owning your own business and hiring other people and to reaching out to clients is two different things. Yeah, hundred percent. And even just going to writing, I think the step to writing was was harder in a way because most people, and this is, I, they probably have their your best interest in mind, or maybe they don't. But like most people will tell you, there is no money in writing. So like when I leave chi left China, um, I I was to meet my girlfriend's family for the first time, and we were in a long term relationship. And I met her father, and the first thing the guy told me is like, oh, do you know there is no money in writing? I'm like, oh. He's like, I'm like, not sure about any of this. Like, I don't need extra support for my fears. Um, but yeah, and then because it was so overwhelming, you just kind of zoom out. And I guess for some people that, that anxiety would become like a crippling factor in their life. But for me, it was like, I just have to, you know, get out of my head and, and start producing and just being more present. And in a, in a weird way, I felt more grounded. I felt humble because like there was zero ego. I was just like striving to survive. And, and that also unlocked so many beautiful things and aspects of my life and also make, makes you feel capable, but also fearful at the same time. It makes you feel like everything's possible, but everything is also not possible at the same time. You, you might fail tomorrow, but you might not fail tomorrow. So like just thinking about failure or not, just... I don't know, became redundant. And, and that made me zoom out and zoom into whatever I fancy doing and kind of connected with my core more. I, I guess I always wanted to be a writer and, and, and a business owner of sorts. I wanted to create our value for others. 
And and this came as a you know like when push comes to shove and you just have to do it. This was this was like on a on a massive scale of biblical proportions. And I and I took it as a sign um, to just go on and do my own thing. And a, a lot of other things like came out of it. I started sleeping better. I, I do believe that every human being needs at least seven or eight hours of, of quality sleep, not just quantity, just not any sleep. I started putting a lot of thought and effort into rest of, of how can I regenerate myself. Uh, that makes me feel better. That makes me happier. That makes my work more wholesome. Other things is like I stopped drinking alcohol altogether, which when I came to England was mental because I don't know, do you feel the, the same way? It was like on every occasion, past breakfast is drinking time. So brunch till brunch. Like you have 20 hour zone when everybody's gonna offer you a drink if you're in a social setting. And I had to like come up with excuses like why are you not drinking? Like because I'm I'm just not drinking wasn't good enough. So it had to be a story. And people are like, what's wrong with you? I'm like, I just don't want alcohol right now. <laughs> and people are like, are, are you sure you're okay? And then another thing is like, you have to drink over colors. I like, if you're outside, you're going to order a drink of sorts, but I also don't want to drink f fuzzy drinks. And then mocktails are just like pretending. I don't know. I, it's, just, it's, it's still an odd one for me, although I haven't had a drink in like, I don't know, 16 months, 17 months, something like that. So yeah. What was the trigger for that change to go completely to sales? Um So this is going to sound like a cliche. Um, I I do have a good run with New York uh, New York New Year resolutions. Um, I stopped smoking in 2014 after being a passion smoker for years. I kind of gave it in a New Year resolution. For me, it was like I'm going to decide this, and then I'm not going to you know think about it again. It's like just decisions made, so I'm not going to fuss about it because. That's how you wear yourself down. And if you start thinking about it too much, you're going to go for the next cigarette or next drink. Then I I, I took the drinking bed and uh, I think it was New Year's 2020 to 2021 uh, because I already wasn't really drinking. I mean, for me, drinks were always like a social lubricant of sorts. Like when you go outside, you have a drink. I didn't really want to start drinking in my own living room. That kind of felt um, sad or like it, at least it wouldn't make me feel good. And also there is a habit forming habit. <laughs> so I didn't want to form that habit in, in the long run. And the third factor is like it just wasn't fun. Like, you know, and I wanted to focus on my own writing, on my own surrounding, creating my own business. So that kind of prevailed. And I would find enough exciting excitement in the business world. So I wouldn't seek it outside of it. If that makes any sense? Because it, like most of the times it was terrifying. You just don't know if you're going to have bread money when you wake up the next morning. So the life was already exciting. One. So when all these three factors collided, I organically or naturally wasn't drinking already. And when the new year struck, I was like, I'm just going to make a tiny resolution of just continue doing what I'm doing. And now it's been now we've passed uh, New Year's, we're into 2022 again. So I, I made a, another resolution this year as well. Uh, I know they don't work for a lot of people, but for me, because they are sl slight habits that you just kind of tweak or amplify. I, I think that that works uh, in that regard. If I try to like lose 40 pounds by, by summer, I think that would be a bad, bad idea or bad decision. And I'd probably fail. But if I try to, you know, just amplify my already made decision, it works. Hi everyone, I hope you're enjoying the episode so far. I want to take a quick break to ask you to check in on yourself. There's many people struggling with balance and there's nothing to be ashamed about. The tips that my guests and I share can hopefully help you along the way, but if you already feel overwhelmed or burnt out, it's probably best that you ask somebody for help too. For some, this might be a friend or family member, but others might feel like they have nobody they can talk to. If you're one of these people, check out the link in the show notes. It's for United for Global Mental Health. They've got help plans all across the world with people willing to listen on the other side. It's important to let somebody know how you're feeling. Now, back to the show. Now, like in the life you've built now, so you're doing a workcation is the word you used earlier, which you then felt immediately ashamed about. Um, but what is the lifestyle you're trying to build at the moment where you have your own business and you're doing writing as part of that business? What does that look like at the moment? How many hours are you working? Is it generally stressful all the time or are you in a good place i think i'm in a good place it is i would say engaging more than stressful 
of course, there is you always have the stress factors. Just any business is like that, you know, from your own internal ones to outside, just other people being humans. So there is always a bit of that, but like I kind of embraced it in a way that I, I do strive in those environments, maybe because of my upbringing, like it started rough and then it get better, it got better over time. So I, maybe that, that's a factor in it. But overall, I I do like the place where I'm in. I'm, I'm grateful. I'm, I do feel a bit, I don't know, like when I came to Mexico, especially this Plata del Carmen, uh, it is overrun by digital nomads. Uh, in a way, that idea sounds awesome, sounds spectacular. I'm just going to be, you know, vagabonding around the world, very on point, the B generation of the 60s. And I, I do fantasize or romanticize that idea, but then I don't want to live it, if you know what I mean. I am super happy to have a base in London and then go for two weeks and the part I'm really grateful is like I can take my laptop and I can work. Uh, otherwise, I would have to be stuck in an office or in, in a third place and I would have to seek two weeks off and, and come. So in, in a way, this is not a proper holiday, but also like I got an opportunity to actually be here and see some Caribbean sun and enjoy, you know, after work, Coca-Cola, the beach, because it's no cocktails. So that, that's nice. But like I wouldn't quite want to live full time. And I feel a lot of people come here searching for something. You're, you don't really find that meaning traveling, which I like. You you obviously traveled a lot. I've seen a few places. And when you're like in your early 20s, it is this exciting idea. And I think everybody has to do it. But after a while, it has been feeling a bit empty. It's like in a way that like you still need a base. You need a home. You need something where you can build and something where you can come back. So just being just vagabonding 24 7 for 10 20 30 years and then speaking to those people and when they're in their 50s and 60s it, i always felt there's like a big uh, part of their life missing which is was back home building building an actual home building a family building something so maybe this is a balance that you have to strike between uh, being home and building and, and vagabonding i don't think one or the other to the extreme is ever good so I, and I think that balance is is the best it has ever been in my life because my early twenties were just travel focused and my late twenties are now you know more of like I'm building something but I'm also gonna go on a vacation and then an actual holiday as well uh, sometimes this year so it feels wholesome for the time being but if that changes I'll be more than you know happy to embrace that change going it by, day by day how is it for you like. Do you feel like you want to go on a holiday soon? It's interesting because I did a lot of travel before I started doing my own thing. So I would have been to 50 countries if it wasn't for coronavirus. I think I was, when the lockdown came in, I was actually in Botswana and all the flights started getting cancelled. The visas started getting rejected and there was a big uh, adventure in getting home, let's say, where there was a legitimate worry that I'd be stuck in Botswana for several months while not being allowed to be in Botswana technically anymore because they said because they rejected they, they said your visas are now cancelled you need to leave the country but then if there was a worry that if there's a proper lockdown in the UK like there was in Australia then I wasn't allowed to be in Botswana but also wasn't allowed to be back home but I got lucky but that that was that was a little bit of a scare yeah and, how did you get lucky? Like, did you just book a flight and just went to the airport and hope for the best, or you had? To yeah, it was really, very, very hard to book flights at that time because everybody was trying to book flights to get out, and like, the, the websites were crashing, the phone lines were overrun, and it was when I got to the airport in so it's like through South Africa to get home, and I got an email saying, "Oh, your flight has been cancelled," and it was my original flight, so if I hadn't got on the flight that I did. I would have been stuck. I would have had to try and work out a way to get home again. So it's not quite as dramatic as your uh, China story. but <laughs> No, it's still like it is like, especially like we all deal with our own, you know, problems and they're all biggest problems for ourselves, for ours. So, yeah, I, I can imagine, you know, like it is being stuck in a, in a foreign place and you can't leave and then nobody's your friend there. Like it, it is a bit... It is a sketch. Yeah. Then it's, it's people say the same thing with me in terms of digital nomadism. Like, oh, why don't you just travel the world? And it's like, well, 
I don't like I, I'm living the life now that I don't need to escape from. And I think that's the thing I always come back to is that like mantra is that build a life that I don't need to go on holiday. I don't need to travel because I enjoy what I've got here. Like I've got a great set of people around me and like, I'm very grateful to them. Hopefully some of them are listening today. And that makes a difference, right? Because a lot of people I think who are very attracted to the idea of digital nomadism is because they don't have those, some of those, that security or that safety that they feel where they live or in their home. And I guess what's kind of different about me is that I, like, it's like you now, right? Like I really enjoy what I do, which means that I'm not needing to count down the days until I go on holiday, which might have been something I did in the past. Now I still want to see new experiences and still want to travel, but it's a want rather than a need. And I think that makes such a difference mentally because it means that when I'm going somewhere, it's because I really want to experience what's there rather than I really want to get away from what I'm doing. And it's this little mindset shift. I think it really matters. And a lot of people I know who are saying, oh, I would travel the world. I would do this. So, but have you actually done that yet? Do you know what that's like? And like I said, it's it's difficult. It's not so easy to be in a different country. And before we started the call, Tony was complaining about how many mosquitoes are pissing at his legs. And I was saying, oh, you're working from paradise and just moaning but it's true there's all these different factors that take you out of the zone where you can produce your best work and what's really meaningful to you and for some people they love that traveling lifestyle they they love that and it's working out whether it's whether you like the actual lifestyle whether you like the idea of the lifestyle and i think for me before i used to like the idea of the lifestyle rather than the reality of trying to find Wi-Fi and trying to find enough signal and finding a comfortable seat. It's, it's hassle, right? And trying to plan while moving and working. It is, it is. And then you can't really relax. You don't produce your best work and all that. Yeah, yeah. I feel like you have to have that like purpose or like at least sense of self first and then, then go on a holiday or on a vacation because I, I prepared most of the stuff up front. And then when I'm here, I'm like just managing stuff. And also this is, I think what I read from Benjamin Hardy, which kind of just like clicked in my head. Guy's a great writer on medium, by the way, it was that you should manage your energy more than you manage your time. And, and I think I, I fell in this fallacy so many times before. It's just like, I'm going to block like three hours between 8 p.m. and 11 because I'm my own boss now, which is like something, it took me a year to be like, okay, you can't really work when you're tired. And then if you just do your own stuff in the morning when you feel the most energetic or when your brain is in the right place, uh, you're just going to like enjoy your work much more. You're going to produce more. And that's what I'm doing right now. So my girlfriend, she kind of sleeps in most days, uh, which is perfect for me. So I wake up at 7, go on and finish most of my day by 11, 12. She wakes up at about 10, 30. She's more on a holiday than I am. And then like the whole afternoon and the evening, we can be out and about, which is which is working well for me. And um, thank you, Benjamin, again, for, for reminding me of that, of that simple truth. But it, it did like create this a massive effect on me because you just get more satisfied with your life later because leisure or relaxing afternoon just becomes your afternoon. You don't have that thing in the back of your head. It's like, oh, I have that three hours blocked in from 8 to 11. And I, oh, but I want to do something else. And I think you did mention this before. You also feel that way. You don't want to work your evenings. And <laughs> I said I don't want to work my evening. That's definitely what's happening at the moment. So you obviously have the same thing because like, most of my clients and most people I work with are LA based. So I'm based in London, obviously. So to me, that's eight hours behind. So they're starting their work day when I want to finish mine. And what I'm working on at the moment is setting those boundaries and setting those expectations in a way where I'll be working while they're asleep is delivered for them in the morning and trying to set it around that mindset rather than I'm not going to reply to you until the next day. It's instead of being like, oh, when you wake up, all your work's going to be done for you. And making them sit through that lens, which I hope will make them more appreciative. And Part of it is, for example, one thing I'm going to do is delete my work emails from my phone because it's so easy for me to just naturally, I'm out and about and I just refresh. Let's see. Let's just see if there's anything there. It's like, I don't need to see if anything's there. Like, I'm not a doctor. It's very, very unlikely that anything's going to blow up that needs my immediate attention. And, but it's hard to let go because, as you said, you're in the same position as a business owner where it's your baby and you <laughs> do it because you enjoy it, but then you don't want to be 
I don't want to be splitting my mind where I'm with people that I want to be spending time with, I want to be present with. In the back of my mind, I think, oh, wait, I need to do that. Oh, I need to do that. Oh, I need to do that. Have you been able to do that? Have you been able to switch off when you are in leisure time? Uh, yeah, most of I, I would I can thank my iPhone. So I recently switched to iPhone full time from being a Samsung user for so many years. And the, the little tweak iPhone has is do not disturb mode. So my phone is always the ringtones off and it is in the not disturb mode. So I don't get any notification. So like if I want to go, if I want to look at my email, I have to physically click on it and then go through it myself. So that creates a little bit of friction where you don't get interrupted by email, which is important for me. I can just leave the, the phone in another room. And when, when I do want to handle my email, I'm just going to go and open my email. That is working well for me. Uh, for some other people, might not, but just creating that extra friction for you. So like it doesn't come up on your screen ever. And then it won't ring ever. And a good thing that comes from it, like also your phone doesn't ring. And your friends and family and everybody, they do start respecting your boundaries. Not at first, but like after a while, they get used to it. And they were like, okay, I'm just going to text him and he'll reply or call me at his own time. And, and that is working well for me. Uh, another thing that I would just like, like to briefly add is uh, scheduling emails. So what I do a lot of times, is like I would schedule an email for 9 a.m. next morning, or I would schedule an email for, I don't know, whatever time you need to schedule them in. So you kind of know that a lot of your email has been taken care of. And I would schedule it in, in my office hours or my work hours that I predetermined. You're usually in the morning because I feel like I just, I am the most productive at this time. And then in the afternoon, I don't have to slug it and I just can't, can go out and, and go out and about. So I think my problem is because of the, the social side of things as well. So, and it's, for example, with like family calling and things like that. So my sister lives in Dubai. So the times that they call and I get, I get to speak to my nephew, that's something that's really important to me and I don't want to miss that. But at the same time, you said it's quite disruptive because if they're calling when I'm in the middle of something and it's about priorities, right? It's like, well, I don't want to miss that opportunity to speak to them. But at the same time, it then puts more pressure on me in terms of my work day. And I don't yet have the right answer for that. Of like, how do I balance that properly? And it's something I'm kind of looking into because if I'm ignoring calls from like to speak to my little baby nephew, because I'm busy working, is that really the life I want to live? Is that who I want to be, but at the same time, if I'm, I can't bend all the time. So I'm in that gray zone at the moment where I'm trying to look at it better. And sometimes I'll have my phone in like airplane mode or like do not disturb mode, as you said. And then other times I won't. So I have that availability. And I think one of the problems for me, and I don't know if you have this as well, is like, I like talking. I like chatting to people. <laughs> like it's yeah. something I enjoy, right? So then if I have my phone off all the time, then I don't have that aspect. And it's, it's kind of like it's a weird personality trait, I guess, where I am quite active, I am quite chatty and generally have, like from the nature of being online and having a brand and things like that, I have a lot more messages than I can actually reply to and I have to prioritise. But then there's sometimes where a friend will send me a joke or a funny something funny and I want to see that straight away. I want to be able to laugh at that and like get involved in the joke and things like that. So... One thing I do, for example, is I use like archiving on WhatsApp. Like WhatsApp is my way that I talk to them, people that know me in real life and have got um, stronger bonds with. And it can be quite intimidating sometimes if you've got 20, 30 WhatsApp messages to reply to. And what I try to do is archive people so that once I've replied to them, then they're off my list. And then I can only see the people that I need to reply to. Because otherwise, some people are replied to instantly, some people is... Hopefully I'm not shooting myself in the foot here if somebody's listening to me right now and I haven't replied to them for a few days. But I've got to do that, right? I've got to try and work out. Some people I talk to and it's a quick answer and I can do that easily. And then other people, it's a more open-ended question and might take a few more days to reply. And that's one thing I use for that is that archiving function. So I only see messages. And I use the same, this is where I manage my inbox as well. With my inbox, the only things that are in my inbox are things that I actually need to do an action on. Everything else is archived or is in another place where I can't see it, which makes it way less intimidating in the mornings when I open up my emails because it's only the new things there. It's only the things which I need to reply to that person or there's some action I want to take. I don't see all of the other emails and then I have to like scroll down to find the ones that need an action from me. 
So I find that helps me quite a bit in terms of just keeping my mind clear. Yeah, that's a good managing system as well, because as you said, as when you become an online creator and as soon, if you are in the space for, I don't know, 12 months, 16 months, you will start receiving a lot of communication from every direction. And at this point, I guess for you as well, social media is just unusable. It's like, if I go to my LinkedIn, I, 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 I kid you not, I have like 200 messages in that inbox. And like, I'm not going to answer that because like it's so intimidating. It's like, I, I can't go through this. Like, I'm sorry, guys. I'm like, maybe, maybe one day, but it just, it feels like it will take half your day. And and maybe that's unfair to a lot of people that did message you on LinkedIn. And, and I am a I'm sorry for that. It's just like it's physically almost impossible to, to just go through everything. So you do have to prioritize. And for me, it works that I, when, I, when I feel social, I will go out and, and, and go, you know, text, text my friends or reply to my messages. They do pile up in your WhatsApp as well, especially if you're in the groups. If you have a group of seven friends, that's going to like pile up to 100 messages in, in two, two hours. If you just like you briefly don't check your phone, like boom, you have 100 WhatsApp messages. What is one shift you think people listening today could make that would make that positive difference in their lives so this is something that that has created a tremendous difference for my own head spaces was wishing happiness to your enemies or somebody that's annoying you or somebody that you don't like uh, it's just like being wishful thing and being like honestly um, appreciative of your enemy and then wishing them all the best uh, even though it sounds counterintuitive it just um, frees up so much of your mental bandwidth it's it just like it is a power move in your own head. It's like you are not controlled by envy. You're not controlled by hatred. You're not controlled by this uh, darker, you know, devices of your own existence. If you just wish them, like, honestly, to be happy and, and to sort their own lives. And uh, I used to meditate on that. I would practice it every day. I would just find like people I, I dislike the most. And then for, it takes 30 seconds of your life and you just wish them all the best in your head. You don't have to call them or tell them or be upfront with it. It's just for your own going good. And I just, I just never felt happier after that. It just felt this, this, it was this mental shift that worked very well for me because I feel envy is something that can consume you and staying uh, on top of that, or hatred is, and staying on top of that, this was one of the coping mechanisms for me. And also, like the next time you actually see that person, the interaction is a bit better. Uh, you're a bit less on your toes. You're a bit less, you know, stressed out by their, you know, existence. So I think it a, a wholesome. It was it created this wholesome effect. It's been a pleasure to chat to you today, Tony. Where can the people listening today hear more about you and what you're up to? So I'm basically present on Medium. Uh, Tony at, uh, dot com, um, or you can visit our agency, medex.digital. Uh, just dot digital doesn't have dot com or anything. It's one of the new, new domains. So you can check out our work or my personal work. I do write a lot about marketing mostly and business uh, as, a, as a topic. So if you're into that, come in and check us out. And then the final thing to end up on is... What's one small thing that's brought you joy recently? Uh, this New Year's resolution is like I started meditating for at least five minutes a day. It's one of those micro habits. Do you mean meditating or medicating? Uh, <laughs> meditating. <laughs> meditating, okay. <laughs> medicating for five minutes. That, that'd, be, that'd be fun. <laughs> that's like having a drink. No, I, I started, so I, 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 do, I did flirt with, with meditation on and off sporadically, and I never actually got that benefit of it. You just do it long, for longer term. And I, I know this comes as a cliche for a lot of people, but I just like, I would break, I, I break my afternoons now with like five minutes, like just detaching myself from everywhere. I have this app. It's like a meditation timer that just keeps a streak and a score. And I'm doing well with streaks. I got an 800 Duolingo streak and I'm having like, what is it? It is January 20th. So I have 19 day streak of meditation and I do feel more uh, grounded overall. And it also does break up my afternoon where I feel the low energy setting in, I kind of just go even lower with, with a five, 10 minutes. And usually that five minutes turns the 15, 20, 30 minutes, which is, I guess, the, the point of having that micro habit. So that has brought a lot of joy to me later. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, I'd love it if you could leave me a five-star review. It really helps to get the message out further. Wherever you're listening, it would be awesome if you could subscribe and to share on your social media channels. If you want to see more of my work and advice, 
You can find all of the links in the show notes. Thank you again for listening and I hope you have a lovely day.